So you're watching another episode of Epic Sketch Time. I'm your mo your uh, host, Mark Monlux. I live in Tacoma, Washington, and I'm basically a freelance illustrator. I have I like to draw a cartoon called The Comic Critic, where I do cartoon reviews of movies. I have two books out. Uh, check out my link below to check out my store. And gentlemen, introduce yourself. Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, my name is... Pat McEwen. Uh, I draw a comic called The Devil and Mr. Gandhi. And uh, you can check that out at devilandgandhi.com. Hi, my name is Locke. I'm from Toronto. I'm an uh, illustrator, I guess. Uh, I don't have a comic right now, but I will have a comic sometime in January. Pub Crawl Anthology. Uh, I'm working on another anthology, 12 pages, and I'm hoping it's going to be accepted by, was it on, Omni Press or something like that? But you can follow, follow me on Instagram, Facebook, uh, whatever. Just look for Mad Monkey Love. That's pretty much it. Put an at in front of it, and you can find me almost anywhere. That's it. Locke, are you pitching right now to Oni Press? Uh my uh, writer friend, uh, there's apparently they, uh, his name is Chris, uh, Christopher. He sent me basically eight, uh, 16 pages in total, I think. They're broken down to three chapters. So they're doing some sort of sci fi anthology. And um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm going over this right now. And I believe it's already accepted. They like the story. And he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's just going over and over again. I'm going to start reading it this weekend or this week uh, a few times, thumbnail it, then go through it again with him. Then maybe we'll break something down because it's more like collaborative than anything else. As I go through the stuff, maybe something didn't work out, like the paneling, the, whatever it is that might not work out. So that's always the case. Sometimes he likes the thumbnail the way I I do the thumbnails and the panels themselves. You know, he writes it. He goes, you know, page one, eight panels, and he tries to fill that stuff. But then I find that eight panels is too much, and I condense that. So those, you know, what we do when we look at comics, right? We just break it down and see what flows, what worked better. And sometimes, you know, something that's in a panel I like more, I make it really big and splashy. And that's hopefully that's the case, right? So. I know that each chapter is eight pages, right? So Oni Press is, I guess they, they break it down into like all these, uh, I think eight page, eight page, eight page anthology of sci-fi, chapter one. So the idea is for you to pick up chapter two, then chapter three, then chapter four and so forth and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Oni Press actually. They did the original, they would publish the original incarnation of the comic Damned by uh, Colin Bunn. And they have some really cool stuff. Like they're, they're one of those publishers kind of like IDW, like right. you can look back at their stuff like 10, 10 years ago and go like, wow, I, I didn't realize they published that. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, so they do some good stuff. Have yeah, you worked? Um, I, I've never heard of them. That's, that's a thing. And uh, you know, my, my, my friend says, yeah, we're, we're going to submit. Uh, I think he already submitted. Um, then I was looking at their website, and it's just like, wow, this is a lot of good stuff on here, like a lot of indie stuff. So, mm -hmm. right. So, actually, it might work out. Um, so, yeah, I'm just waiting for the pub crawl stuff. It's funded. I think we, we've we reached our funding goal in less than five days, but I think we made it up to about ten thousand. Our stretch goal was fourteen, but that was still pretty good. So, whatever we do, we can we can actually go on issue number two. So the pub crawl anthology is basically, you know, uh, stories that take place in a, in a pub, right? Uh, my eight page was a sci-fi kind of matrixy kind of thing on top of that, right? So that was it worked out really well. It worked out really well. I kind of like drawing sci-fi stuff. So, and how many? How often do you work with like a writing co-collaborator? Because um, I, I work with the writer a lot better than. Um, than uh, myself. Uh, I tried writing a few times, you know, a lot of the story, story, but dialogue is horrible for me. You know what I mean? Then I took a boot camp thing with Ty Templeton, 
And he said, you know, the only way to get dialogues is listen to people. That's just <laughs> so I figured, okay, maybe I should do that. And you know, the, his his boot camp, he was teaching us about like the character bible and you know how to build the character and all this other stuff. But dialogue is extremely tough, and that's why even like talented writers that write screenplays for movies have to have other people come in just to work on the dialogue. Because yeah, yeah, I, I find it really difficult to like. I have no problem. I I can visualize like, each characters and their behavior but the the stuff that comes out of their mouth it's just it's too flat for me right you know it's like anything i write it's very flat <laughs> visually i can put it out but the dialogue is just too flat right and, and sometimes maybe i want to you know I, he's not sh saying shakespeare or anything like that but i just want like a, a you know like a real character and that's that's really what the the case is right just trying to figure that stuff out um yeah, when it comes to this kind of stuff, um, because I did storyboards when I was living in LA, uh, storyboard was a different beast compared to comics, right? Comics is is one frame is pretty much an action, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like a, a time segment, uh, that, that piece, right? While in a storyboard sequence, you know, I got a page and that's a minute worth of film, but that could be... 50 cuts <laughs> right and, and and you know the director might want you know like a guy jumping out of an airplane or something like that then i gotta draw all these little angles to tell that kind of stories but you know I, I might have you know 60 panels to draw it in right right i want a different angles and all this other stuff while in comics you're kind of stuck to you know uh six by nine around that area or within that space you got that one page and you try to tell as much and try to engage the audience within the 22 pages you know so i found that a little harder <laughs> well i hope your writer gives you enough scenes where you can have some like cool close-up of character faces and some cool action because i, I well that, that's, that's where um he's he's he, he's an amateur writer himself and uh sometimes he writes too much within that one <laughs> panel but he's writing it for me right so he's describing those the scene itself then me visually i have to plot out like the, what i always do with storyboards is i plot out the the scene itself in that room or whatever then i gotta make sure that if the character's on the left he's always on the left right if even if i switch cameras or, or switch angles and stuff like that i gotta make sure that whatever objects that's in that scene you know tells that scene and and that's that's what i run into is sometimes he forget that you know he writes where you know the character's walk into the room, his head is turned, you know, this other action's happening and or that action. I say, well, you can't do that. I have one frame, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And and then those are the things, maybe I can stretch that out. Uh, or um, the last one, the pub crawl one was the, the hardest part was the three pages in the middle where it was just two person in the bar, you know? There are two talking heads, and, and I was just couldn't do it. You know, <clears throat> I, I did the first first page, and that was no problem. Whipped that out. I love that. You know, the staging and all that stuff. Second page kind of got into the establishing stuff more. Then third, fourth was just a grind of just talking head. So I had to do things. I said, oh, okay. I, I noticed that you know he uh, he's describing the character fidgeting with the beer. Is the the, the uh, the stein he's holding in his hand. So, so I said, you know what? Instead of showing his face, why don't I just show hands and sure. you know, just to break up the monotony of the stuff. So after I got over that hump, that was just one of those things where I was like, oh, yeah, I, I really don't like drawing talking heads. Huh. Right. But you know, it's it's one of those things. I rather have these different scenes where the angles are a little different and stuff like that, but. You know, you end up with those things. Like some people don't like drawing stuff, but you know, you have to draw it. <laughs> huh. Let's see. I got a uh, just finished off a uh, 
commission. I wonder why it's flashing like that on the screen. I don't know either. I'm trying to figure that out. What's going on? There we go. Aha. <clears throat> Looks very nice. Yeah, it's uh it's uh it's a local Toronto creator. Uh it's about a uh a, a scientist, a deep water scientist who I guess built this suit that can talk to fishes, right? Like an octopus kind of thing, and these people wanted it or something like that. So he asked me to do a variant cover. So he sketched a really rough pencil of the idea, and I ended up, uh, let's see if I can find it. I ended up uh, drawing it for him. There you go. That's his drawing. So I noticed that you decided to go ahead and put a face in the mask. Uh, yeah, the, the the character itself is is a uh, a female character, and and uh, the the original cover that was done was um, uh, he he took the same class I did, Ty Templeton's. Uh, comic boot camp kind of thing and uh, and he asked Ty to actually draw him the cover he paid Ty to draw the cover so he did the cover and Ty did the thing where you can actually see the face and stuff so I figured I'd take a little bit of that and I, I you know wanted the face <laughs> so that that's where I came in I was gonna make it a little darker in that in the face area but I think he wanted a little bit more brighter or something like to recognizable a little bit more. So the idea was, you know, it's just a mystery. I, I, I don't even know what the, uh, the, the second issue is going to be. Uh, it's still being written right now. So this is the concept anyways. So mysterious character, soldiers, you know, stepping on the head. And I threw in the added uh, shell casing and, you know, the... Uh, yeah, uh, that's one cover right there. So I think it's going to be for January. Well, I just want to point out, too, that as someone that has taken a couple art classes, I think you do a great job of taking that sketch. You have some of the, you know, you incorporate all the major things that the person wanted in there. Yeah. But then you also have, I have, I took a screen grab of your, of your artwork here and put it in my program. Right. And just having like, you know, these great intersecting lines here where even, even the bullet casings kind of like frame how you're, how you're seeing the art, you know what yeah. I mean? It, it's, so, it's, it's, so, I'm, I'm so, forcing you to focus. Yeah, exactly. This is undoubtedly the focal point here right. because you've got these great angles kind of just pointing it out, framing it. You know what I mean? Even, you know, all this just draws your eye right there. But I, I really yeah. like how, you know, you, 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 you added some real craftsmanship to the rough sketch that the guy gave you. Yeah. yeah. He, he was just a, uh, he was a writer and he could draw. Um, this is what he drew. And I, I, I saw it and I said, oh, that, that is something, right? I could work with that. <laughs> yeah, I could work with that. That's, that's not bad, right? <laughs> I, I would love it if my writer can thumbnails for me. <laughs> right? But yeah, it's, it, 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 it's going to work out. Uh, it's going to work out. Yeah, the uh, the comic itself is called Oketana and Ko. So he asked this. This is the, what led into it was he had a blank cover, and I said, "Let me sketch on that." So I, I drew the character, and it's supposed to be she could talk to octopus and stuff like that. So it's kind of like I guess Aquaman or something or Aquawoman kind of stuff, but. There's a deeper story behind that, so I, I don't know the the whole fit idea, right? Yeah, I was uh, like 
I, I went through and um, Vistaprint had these, right? So, so I made these uh, posters. And are they technically paper or are they more like a vinyl? It's a vinyl. It's a vinyl. It's really thin vinyl. It's not bad for five bucks, right? Can't really go wrong. So, you know, they if, if you folded them, you'll you'll definitely get crease in them. Okay. So it's you know, it, it's a vinyl sheet. And I figured I'm gonna um, I bought these uh, clips, these poster clips. So I'm going to interconnect them and just have one big banner out of them because they're only 20, 20 inches by 36 inches, right? So I'm going to use them as my backdrop of some sort. So I, I tried out different tones and stuff like that. And, you know, I got the, the pub crawl poster for that, the pinups, then uh, the, uh, the orc issue zero variant cover I did for chapter house. So I, I printed that just to, you know, it turned out okay, turned out okay. Did these Ninja Turtles. And it was a, it was a good deal, five bucks. I couldn't give it up. So you invested what, maybe 30 bucks there? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. They're, uh, I did a close up so you can see it's digital printing, right? So, right. I just like, uh, I took the illustrator, built the frame, built all the stuff. Exported as a 350 DPI PNG and uh, upload it on their website. Yeah, I have to be honest. I have never been disappointed by Vistaprint. And the one time I had an item that didn't work out, they refunded my money. So. Yeah. Trying to do a bunch of other ones. Uh, this one, I'm trying to see if I can get this printed to the, uh, the cover for issue zero. I've already started to pre-book my next year's uh, con. Mostly Ontario, the big ones anyways. Uh, got into Nag Comic Con sometime in June. Bruce Campbell, the big stars, uh, you know, Back to the Future people, you know, a bunch of uh, and stuff like that. So I got three days that that was about four hundred dollars Canadian. Uh, speaking of uh, conventions, I. Uh created a entry for Emerald City Comic Con's Monsters and Dames. You guys want to see it? Yeah, please. So this is it untrimmed. I was kind of going down to the water on it and uh, had to, I wanted to do more shading, but it was either submit it or not get it done in time. Right. I, wish I like what you did with the monster. Oh, thank you very much. That is, uh, I like the texture there. Wow, that really reminds me. The first thing I saw was uh, Cookie Monster. <laughs> as long as you didn't think Monsters Inc., that's the only thing. That's I right. No, it was just it was the, the the texturing. It looked like fur. It looked really good. You did a I, great job there. I wanted to uh, kind of get the same. Um, is uh, yeah, I wanted to get the same kind of color as Cookie Monster. Yeah, it's sort of like that friendly look. Yep. The whole idea was to do warms in the middle and then uh, do coolers on the outside so the focus would be more on the little girl. Right. Yeah. And I just grabbed a pre-established palette that I had out of the box. Like You could see where the rug is overly plain, and I wanted to do like you know details on that to kind of throw it back and 
like I did the details on, on the inside of the box to throw that back. Right. And but yes, yeah, ran out of time. This is what happens when you can't come up with any good ideas until like two days ahead of time, and then the client throws you a deadline. <laughs> anyway, and right now I'm working on. This is actually part of a reanimator poster that I made into uh, um, some pins. And then I was talking to a t-shirt guy that I, he and I, first I bought t-shirts from him, then he bought books from me, then we started exchanging stuff rather than buying stuff. And then we, he was saying, oh, that's a great looking cat. I said, yeah, it is. He thinks, do you, are you going to put that on a t-shirt? And I said, well, how about you put it on your t-shirts for me? So I'm going to make it as a vector, send it over to him. I have, I do my own t-shirts, but I really want to get away from that because doing fulfillment on t-shirts is a big pain in the neck. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. <laughs> so if he can sell them and make a profit, then more power to him. And what keeps happening is this is the second no, third time I've done the inside purple section of this. And uh, because I'm running an old CS4, it, it I wasn't saving often enough. And I lost, I've lost it twice. <laughs> so I hope, hopefully I won't uh, lose it this time. Control S, Mark. Control S. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, you know, you get so engrossed. You, you forget. <laughs> I like these programs that you you know when you're working like in financial programs, it's automatic saves every 20 seconds. You don't even have to hit the button, you know. Adobe the the new C C C stuff does that, but it's a hit and miss. I find it. it I always do the control S. <laughs> it's built in. My finger just twitches it. <laughs> So the most I've ever lost was back in the day, I lost four hours worth of work because I forgot to save. And I was saving to a disk because the client told me that the computer was unreliable. <laughs> but did I listen to him? No. And uh, next thing you know, because I hadn't saved it to the disk, just saved it onto the computer, it uh, all went away. had this one computer, I called it Lazarus, because oh. I brought it back from the dead so many times. <laughs> I love um, system-wide backups like Time Machine that are completely built in now. It saves my bacon so much. And for those of you who do not have an external backup hard drive. You're, you're living life on the edge. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> and once a year, I'll go to my safety deposit box and I'll pull out a terabyte drive. <laughs> I'll, I'll back up everything on the terabyte drive and then put it back in the safety deposit box because you never know when there's going to be a fire or a flood or this old cheese grater of a Mac I'm using will finally go tits up. Gentlemen, I'm going to take a quick break, but I will be Oh. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so, Locke, what uh, what projects do you have uh, besides this that you're working on this month? Uh, the the cover is done. Um, the creator he likes it. Uh, Yuri, his name is Yuri. Um, uh, he likes it, and uh, he told me that uh, he's going to get back to me about my export. I gave him uh, a compressed PNG, uh, approximately 600 DPI or 400 DPI, and uh, my PSD file without the layer, everything all compressed. And I said, do you want me to, because there's already 86 megs for the uh, Photoshop file uh, of this. All compressed, though, of course. But I was asking him, does he want um, the the layers themselves? Because I have everything all grouped, and that way, if he decided to put the title behind the character or in front of the character or these guys, he welcome to do that. But he said he was going to get back to me, so um, I was thinking of just exporting it anyways, then then taking all these layers I have and compressing them. So because. In, in my project alone, it's just, you know, these are, that's just one of the characters and these are the other sub characters. And so everything's kind of broken down, but you know, it's just layer, 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 copy layer, whatever. But I try to name them and organize them into four groups. I have a background, a foreground, uh, a rough, all my layers and stuff like that. So that's the thing. Now, with files that large, do you use Hightail, or does he just have a, a server access that you can send it over? I, I have a, um, I have Google Drive, and I upload that there, and I just share him my link. Um, then he downloads it or whatever until he says, okay, you know. Um, he's the only one who has to share because I just have to add him to the email, right? Right. Um, I pay approximately... Twelve dollars Canadian a month for two terabytes of cloud storage from Google. Uh, I know it's a lot less in the U.S. I think it's nine ninety nine or something like that. Um, and you know, you get full access to all their whatever. And that's what I use a lot. Uh, I used to use Dropbox, but Dropbox got really expensive. I just use a, a free thing called Hightail to send large files. Right. Does that, um, it's just a locker, right? Yeah, it, uh, it basically, it's good for about six business days. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. So they have to download it. Uh, it doesn't stay there. Right. But with most, most of the corporations that I'm working with, it's, right. uh, they don't want stuff potentially accessible. Yeah, a, a lot of my stuff is I only share with that specific email. And if you don't have that email, you can't literally can't get into it. It's Google's way of privacy protection. There's also a, a shared folder where I just get the link and anybody with the link. Um, I have it set for just read only, you know, or download only or whatever the stuff is. But like some of the uh, some of my clients, because I, I deal with like uh, sending files back and forth and it takes a couple weeks or maybe they have to upload something. It's easy right. for me if I just give them full access to that, just that directory, right? Right. So we go back and forth. Then once that project is done, I just disconnect the share. Once everybody's all happy, everybody got their files and stuff like that, so. That sounds good. Yeah. Trying to see if I can put together maybe a banner of this too. Now, were you with us last week? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, yeah. But I don't need to tell you uh, all about Stowe. Yeah. We're all caught up with him. But I did find out something new from him when I was talking to him this morning. Um, it's five o'clock. He realized that he's not one to work um, 
overly fast on some of his projects. I mean, he has this book mainly done, but it needs some editing to go through because he didn't get the stretch goals that he wanted to get accomplished done. So they're, they're trying to think of, well, what can they do to the book instead of those stretch goals? Do they put them in anyway? Because he really wanted to include them. And I'm telling, I'm telling, you know, you got to save that for another time. And he says, but I really want to do it. And I said, well, you didn't get funding for it. And he says, yeah. Anyway, but he did let everyone know um, that it wasn't going to be delivered until basically next year. Right. And I was kind of hoping, oh, man, I, I like getting delivery on things a lot faster than that. Right. When I do mine, I I delivered mine within three months, just like I said it was. Right. But you, you, I find that the I I back a lot of the project when it's done. <laughs> yeah. Or close to being done. Um, I feel better that way because at least I know. Right, uh, I understand when it comes to printing and shipping logistics. You know, things will happen. Like, you know, up here in Canada, we there's just got the Canada Post strike, right? So just right into the Christmas season. <laughs> so I'm not getting anything till January. Let's put it that way for a, for a lot of the stuff, right? But I understand that. I had no idea that there, there was a holiday postage strike happening in Canada right now. Yeah, yeah, there there is. Um, I, I think they, they just went through legislation and they, they had like a work to rule thing that just came in or something that just got passed. So at least for now. So but it's a rotating strike. Let's put it this way. Right. Everybody still get their mail on time. Uh, there's issues, you know, like security checks and stuff like that for the old age people that might need it and all that stuff. So those are, are being delivered. Um, but, you know, anything that isn't priority, you know, that isn't life, you know, like my Kickstarter campaign, that's not life threatening. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. We all understand that. Right. And it's and, and you know they, they use that the holiday season as a way to you know get more money right and I understand that I understand that so but a lot of the time I, I find that the Kickstarter campaign works best when the project is literally almost done right right and uh, a lot of the time was um, even our project uh, a lot of the books the only Thing that was left was my portion my eight pages and I was already um, I was contacted like three weeks before the project was gonna launch Kickstarter <laughs> because the uh, the other artists bailed right right and and I got pulled into that and I said yeah I'll, I'll offer the help and um, they put me on the $150 tier where I offered to do uh, a bunch of commissions, uh, black and white. Uh, if they do that, and now I'm, you know, they're, he's, he's going to start emailing these people once uh, Kickstarter released the fund, I think. That's what we're waiting for right now. Then once the, the fund is being released, then at least we know that I can start working on the, uh, you start contacting the uh, the backers and asking about their commissions and stuff like that, then they'll forward it to me, the information, then uh, I'll start working on the piece uh, over the holiday and mail them directly and just, you know, send them the postage uh, receipts. And, you know, they'll pay back for all that. But other than that, yeah, we're, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. I'm waiting for a 12-page script from the local uh, artist friends and writers and stuff. We have our own little magazine going on, uh, but that isn't, you know, Kickstarter isn't going to be starting around March or so, so I'm still good. Then I figured uh, I take on this uh, Oni Press stuff because I, I like doing sci-fi, and my my partner, my writing partner there, he he likes, uh, you know, he does a lot of zombie stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he likes zombie, and I like sci-fi, so he's but. He figured if he can get some 
a bunch of books published under his under his belt by you know known publisher it's a good thing it's a good thing and i said yeah you know what just send it my way and i'll read over it i'll start thumbnailing in a couple weeks time i'll try to get the first eight and that way we can get it in then we'll do the the next eight and so forth until we get all three chapters then at least we can say look we you know we got 16 pages in three books done right and uh that way i can get a buy a, a bulk of these uh those books and actually sell it at my table at the show that's what i was looking forward to is actually having books at the table to sell yeah uh, that's that's my thing because you know you you've done a lot already i saw your books and stuff like that so at least you 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 can say that because I, I didn't want to be the guy sitting there just selling prints you know what i mean <laughs> i know exactly what you mean yeah <laughs> all right I've, I've done uh like chapter house gave me a stack of books last uh sunday or this past sunday yeah uh it was just a small community thing, and they said, hey, Locke's going to be out here, going to do signing of issue zero. <laughs> so they gave me a stack of books, and I was just going through the comic book bins, and I saw the, I saw the, the variant cover of that issue zero, and it's worth 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Unsigned, right? Unsigned. And I'm staring at it. I'm sitting next to it. I was like, if I open this, does it, like, devalue the thing? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I pretty much sat there all day, all, all you know, from ten till four, and people just came by and talked, but nobody bought a book. <laughs> That's the life. <laughs> I'm like, dang, oh well. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, I did the uh, the deck of cards completely because I just wanted to do a deck of cards. Yeah, and it was just a big old lark for me. Right. And then it turns out to be selling better than the books. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and your bingo cards too, right, Mark? Oh yeah, the bingo cards. You got bingo cards? I have this thing called horror movie bingo. And what I did was I took 150 movie tropes, things that uh, you know pop, you know, like Blood Trail or Spring Loaded Corpse or. Uh, Pulsing egg sac and or pupa, or or overaged teenage actor or bad acting things like that, and uh, I spread them out onto twenty five different cards. Each card is different; they're all numbered. And then what you do is you hand them out before you watch a horror movie, and you see who gets to bingo first by seeing whose tropes pop up first. So yeah, people like those. I think they would sell better if I had a box for them. As it is right now, I sell them in a little Ziploc bag. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like you you put sandwich you, you know freezer bags. Right. Because that's the cheapest way I can you know um, get them. Get, yeah, the, to put them in a bag for somebody. I just mark them, you know. I, I, I buy these things from a place called Clear Bags. Clear Bags? Yeah. Well, there's Uline, but I have yet to find something that has... that's the right size, that has... I, pre I would prefer to have a Ziploc enclosure at the top of it rather than a peel and stick. Yeah, I, I used I like the peel and stick, but that's the one I got anyway. So uh, clear bags sells those one with the ziplocs, the resealable ones. Well, I'll see if they. I'll call. I'll check online and see if they have one that fits. So far, none of them fit just right. Right. And uh, you know, this is a pre-formatted size that I'm getting from. Uh, uh, let's see. Five by sevens or something like that, or yeah, five by sevens. Yeah. And the thing is that if I sell them in batches, the bag has to be thick enough to allow for that batch. The the clear bags they have five by sevens with like 
extra space, you can buy them a little bit larger. You know what I mean? Yeah, I wonder if they'd send me off a bunch of samples if I asked. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they can. Um, I, you know, a lot of my times, like a lot of my sketch cards, uh, my four by six, um, I bought them at uh, their bags. I bought them like four one fourth by six one eighth, right? Instead right. of an actual four by six, I gave them a little bit more room just in case for wiggles and stuff like that. And they worked out really well. You mean no? They 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 customize the bag size for no, you? No, no. Uh, they they have to uh, like even though you can specify it's four by six, then there's you know four by six and a half. You know what I mean? Or a little bit. So you can get a little bit bigger before they become five by seven or something like that. I see what you mean. Right. So I always go with the extra space, and you know, a lot of the time I'm sitting there with a ruler and yeah. <laughs> Right, so I look at their thing and they, they specify oh, it's four by six and one sixteenth, and I'm like four by six one sixteenth, and I lay it down. It's like oh, okay, it's a little too tight, right? Because <laughs> sometimes um, my my cards, if somebody wants to buy two or three of them, right, I just want to make sure instead of giving them three bags, I just give them the one bag, right? right. With all three cards in there. I usually sell them in batches of four, eight, twelve. And then 20 right or 25 so uh yeah it's uh it'd be nice if there was a nice you know maybe even do another run of cards uh that just explained the game why, why don't you just like you know get something a little bit big, bigger and, and do uh, a card that is a lot larger for with instructions or something on it. Like for example, let, let's say you do a, a sheet that you could be printed on eight and a half by 11 and step those in there. At least you have a lot of room and you, at least you know that one back backing or whatever it is that's in there, right? Because I do a lot of promo on my stuff. I throw in business cards, I throw in a little promo yep. into the bag too. For that, when I sell it at the show, at least they walk away and they say, oh, where that came from? Oh, you know, here's my my business card in there and maybe a promo for a Kickstarter that that might be coming down or something like that. Or a lot of the time I, I do these little poster gives away because um, it's holiday seasons and we have these little cons around the area and uh, the local con likes to do um, like food drives. So if you bring in a can of non-perishable food or packet or something like that, they give you raffle tickets. So I donate, you know, a bunch of uh, Hellboy posters, Deadpools and stuff like that. And the kids love that, right? So the kids are walking around throughout the whole con. They, and at the same time, I, instead of sealing the bag, I tell the promoters to throw in a bunch of flyers and stuff like that in there too. So it, it's, I, I do like a lost league, right? Because what happens is uh, when the person wins the posters, the, the guy says, hey, bring it to so-and-so's table at, over there. You know, sign it for you. And I get a promo picture with them at the same time. So that's clearbag.com, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in Canada, it's .ca. Okay. So uh, So Patrick, I see you're back with us. What uh, what pulled you away? Was it the domestic bliss? It was <laughs> my dog needing to be taken out, but refusing to be taken out by my wife. He must be taken out by me. So it's like having children, man. <laughs> <laughs> when I had my dog. I trained him to uh, do his, his movements on command. And uh, that was very useful. I guess so. Well, if you feed the dog at the same time every day, and uh, yeah, it was just a matter of it was something I learned from my trainer. He said, so you want to make your life easier? Just train your dog to poop with this command and pee with this command and 
life will work so much better. And uh, he was so right. So. <laughs> I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying sounds to me like your wife isn't in the alpha position in the pack. <laughs> I miss my dog. He was a great, great Dane. What type of dog is your dog? He is a long-haired miniature dachshund. So basically the complete opposite of a great Dane. He is 10 pounds. <laughs> And he rules the house. He does, with an iron paw. <laughs> hey, look, what's the... Uh... Um, Canadian version of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> eh? <laughs> you hoser. Yeah. <laughs> I'm almost afraid to ask, is it on the same day? or <laughs> Mark, come on, man. It's like a couple weeks earlier. Even I know that, and I'm a... I'm, uh... That's right. American Yankee. <laughs> we call it can, uh, we call it Thanksgiving, eh? <laughs> it's when the Canadians first gave donuts to the native peoples. That's exactly it. <laughs> and tin bits. <laughs> <laughs> We leap from tree to tree. Right. I want to be a lumberjack. Everybody here is a lumberjack. Now, I've always wondered, what is Canadian bacon called in Canada? <laughs> bacon. <laughs> I, I really don't understand that one. That was like, for us, it's just bacon. <laughs> it's like, why, why would the Canadian bacon? I guess the pigs were born in Canada. I don't know how that worked. <laughs> well, it's funny. Every once in a while at, at my work, we discuss the fact that... So, Mark, you, Locke, you might be uh, maybe old enough. I know Mark is old enough to know that back in the day, uh, there were these ads for that uh, Ricardo Montalban would shill for. Right. And it was for selling a car. With he, Corinthian leather. Rich Corinthian, Corinthian leather, leather, that's right. This was just a marketing thing. It was like, it's there is no Corinthian leather. No, it's vinyl. It's vinyl. <laughs> it's a texturized vinyl. <coughs> I remember um, Ricardo Montalban talking, but you know, you can sell textured vinyl if you say rich Corinthian leather. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Hey, boss, is he playing? Is he playing? Speaking of that particular actor. Yeah, there was a movie made. Jose Velchez. A, a, a movie is being made of his life with uh, the guy. Uh, Games of Thrones. Yeah. Peter uh, Dinklage. Dinkley or uh, Richard Dinkley or something like that? Peter Dinklage. Dink yeah. Peter. Peter Dinklage. Yeah. If you've never seen him in a film called The Station Agent, you got we gotta watch this film. It's superb. I've been a I was a big fan of his long before uh, he got that gig on Game of Thrones.
So he does the uh, British version of death at the fun death at a funeral, and then does the American version <laughs> as well. That's right. And I'm thinking, a poor guy. <laughs> yes, sir. He's, <laughs> he's stuck in a good movie and then a bad movie of the same role in the same role. Because the American version just isn't as good. Oh, and then I remember seeing him in this movie. It's a, a movie about the making of an indie movie, behind the scenes type thing. And he's the uh, he's the, the dwarf who who's brought in, and uh, because there's a dwarf in the film, and as the actor of the dwarf, he's complaining bitterly how all these independent movies, all they ever want to do is have a dwarf in the movie as the token weird little dwarf in the movie. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the weird little... And he goes on this rant that's just absolutely wonderful. And then his character in the movie um, is uh, his once he plays the weird little dwarf in the movie, he's so angry looking that it makes the weird little dwarf role in the movie look even weirder. <laughs> And it's perfect for the film. And oh my God, that's a hilarious film. I think Brad Pitt is also in that movie. And Jennifer Aniston? Oh man, I'm going to have to take a look. There's a lot of. This was a whole. It was a wonderful dark comedy. Was that Hail Caesar? No. No, no, that was not Hail Caesar. No. It was. No, Hail Caesar's all about uh, Hollywood and its golden age. Oh, was it? Okay. I haven't seen it, so. Oh, and it's it's wonderful. One of uh it kind of you know missed the audience with the Cohen Brother films, some of them are hit or miss with the audience. Right. Oh, but if you haven't seen it yet, um it's on Netflix right now. Um The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Absolutely beautiful, wonderfully done. Hmm. Yeah, that was done in like super limited release, so it could qualify for like Oscar consideration, and then it went to Netflix, right? Right. Yeah, I've I've heard other people give it a good. It is one of their best pieces. Really. It's a what they do is it's an anthology of cowboy stories, of westerns. But you know how there are different types of westerns? Okay, so rather than playing around with the different type of westerns, what they did was they played around with the different types of emotions that are evoked by different type of western stories. So you've got the singing cowboy um, type story that you're familiar with in some movie roles with uh, uh oh man why can't i think of their name like those clint eastwood one the spaghetti uh, no, 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 no. by singing cowboys i mean cowboys actually strumming on the gut guitar yeah gene autry yeah, gene autry yeah, like yeah those guys guys with white hat that's where all that came from white hat bat, black hat right yeah so that's supposed to make you feel a certain way when you watch it. You're, there are certain expectations you want emotionally from that type of film. Right. So they looked at each type of Western, you know, like um, the grub staking Western, you know, where there's a minor involved or the, uh, well, there's about eight different ones. And what they did was they went in Look for the type of motion that that story was supposed to be evoking, and then like squared it. 
and did everything they could to really accent that part of the storytelling. And it just came across, each story comes across really solid, 100% on, and it's just, it's just a real joy to watch. Hmm. Let's see, there's a, the grub staking one. Who's the actor? Uh, he's a well-known jazz musician. Has God, has a real gravelly voice. He's done some other movie pieces that I really like too. Oh, what's his name? Oh man, that's <laughs> it's gonna be a gala night. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going to have to. Uh, Check this out. I know that the Ian, uh, Liam Nielsen's in it. I remember that. I think he didn't. He bring back uh, one of the actors from Oh Brother, Where Out Thou? Out Art Thou too? Oh yeah, uh, he's. That particular actor plays Buster Scruggs in the first. Oh, okay, movie. cool. Uh, let's see. There's also Clancy Brown, who's a great character actor. He's been in a number of westerns, some sci-fi stuff, and uh, let's see. Who's this guy I'm thinking of? Yeah. Tom Watts. Hmm. Um, if you have ever heard Tom Watts sing, Waits. Tom Waits. Pardon me, Watts. God, my. I <laughs> yeah, but Tom Waits. He does this one song. That's nothing but one line promo j jingles, like only a dollar and step right. Oh, I think it's called Step Right Up. <laughs> well, I have to say, one of my, when you started talking about the singing cowboy, a, a true classic of comedy is, of course, Three Amigos. Oh, oh my God. And they like at the perfect point in the movie, they just sidestep into this. You know, they're around the campfire and they start strumming the guitar and start singing the song. And then, like, the, the animals are kind of like gathering around the campfire and kind of joining <laughs> in. And it's this great, great scene. I love that. That's where the, the campfire scene where they're eating bats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Blazing Saddle, Campfire Seed. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the language they use for the movie is superb um, because it, a lot of language back then was really eloquent. People used the words because that's all they, you know, they were proud of their vocabulary. Oh, well, I want to watch um, Tombstone. I never got around to watching much of it. And part of the reason I loved it so much was the elegant language they were using when they weren't swearing. <laughs> so, have either of you guys seen Tombstone? Uh, the the uh, series? You know, I've seen parts of it, but I, I don't know if I've ever sat down and watched it from beginning to end. Is that the one with Kurt Russell? Yes. Yeah, I saw it. Love that movie. No, no, no. It's not a movie. It's a series. Oh, no. Then I would not know. No. Mm, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I thought you were talking about the movie. Yeah. No, no, this is a series.
Well, that's why I kind of liked. Um, I really enjoyed this the BBC series Ripper Street because although it's set at like turn of the century England, it does not have a. They don't, in my opinion, as someone with a couple degrees in, in literature, they don't speak in Dickensian English nor is it a kind of Victorian or an Edwardian. Like it, it's much more Shakespearean, even though it's turn of the century. And um, some of the, the speeches and soliloquies are, are quite poetic, which is definitely a draw for me in terms of a, a, of a series. And it's just, br it's a brutally harsh type of uh, TV show too, but. Oh, I loved Ripper Street during the first season, but uh, my wife just didn't get into it during the second season, so I stopped watching it. I mean, they definitely, they, uh, you know, we, we watched until the very end, and the very end was very dark, and it kind of looked cobbled together by the, you know, the, the last season was clearly like a let's wrap things up type of season. Um but I think at least season one and two I thought were very enjoyable. I think it wasn't until the later seasons that – and they're kind of weird too because since they're BBC shows, so it's kind of like each season is like a different number of episodes. Like it's, it's kind of weird that way. Um, and sometimes the American – they like shorten them to kind of like fit an American like uh, time frame, that type of thing. Like if you look at how they're presented on like – Amazon in the UK versus the the US that they have different like playing times in terms of minutes and stuff like that. Um, oh, I just realized it wasn't uh, Tombstone. It was um, oh oh, it's coming to me. What's it called? You're not talking about Deadwood, are you? Yes, Deadwood. Thank <laughs> you. And on that mental flub, I have to let you guys go. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to do the ender. You've been watching another uh, hour of Ethics Sketch Time. If you would like to join the drawing sessions, all you have to do is subscribe by clicking out the information link below. You can also check out both uh, Locke and Patrick's uh, websites. They're also listed down here, as well as myself and other people. If you uh, join us three times in a row, you too, or not, or just three times, you too can be added to the list of links. We meet uh, usually every Monday, except for federal holidays in the U.S. at 4.30. And I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.